All right, recording has started. Hello and welcome to the Brentwood Darlington Neighborhood Association Virtual Candidate Interview Series. My name is Chelsea Powers and I'm the current chair for Brentwood Darlington Neighborhood Association, also known as BDNA. In normal circumstances, BDNA would host in-person events to help our neighbors get to know local candidates. Since these are not normal circumstances, we have decided to interview candidates virtually. Today's interview is with Chloe Udaly, incumbent commissioner running for re-election for Portland City Council position number four. Commissioner, thank you for agreeing to this interview. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay, well, thanks, thanks for having me and thank you for this format. I'm excited to have a chance to get more in depth on some of your questions. I did the um, EPAP forum last night and we had two minutes and exactly two minutes to answer each question um, and I think it was a good experience for me to be on the other side of the table, because as you know, when you come to city council, you're limited to two or three minutes, but some of these issues are so complex that they really, we can't do them justice in two minutes. So yes, I'm Chloe Udaly. I'm running for re-election re to Portland City Council. Uh, I was born in Portland, raised in rural Oregon, moved back here as a teenager. Uh, came of age as an activist during the first Gulf War and have been involved in activism and advocacy for my entire adult life. I opened a specialty bookstore when I was 24 years old called Reading Frenzy and that is what I um, did up until winning my seat on city council. I also co-founded a nonprofit called the Independent Publishing Resource Center which is an amazing maker space for independent artists, writers, uh, and self-publishers. And I co-founded the Special Education PTA of Portland uh, several years ago, which is no longer running, but it was intended to give a voice to PPS families, raising kids with disabilities and receiving special education services. Um, I have a young adult son, Henry, who is 19 years old and an amazing kid and also has significant disability. So being his mom set me on a path of uh, disability advocacy from the very early days of his life. It's what I devoted much of my time to outside of work and parenting until about five years ago. Um, I've always been a renter. I've always been of modest means and I was really beginning to struggle to keep a roof over my head. And uh, I started a Facebook group on a lark, which is now called The Shed. It had a little spicier name uh, to begin with, uh, really meant as a place for my friends and I to commiserate through humor about the um, rent crisis we found ourselves in. So we were making you know, mock Craigslist ads for bird houses and uh, coffins and empty chairs on the side of the road. And then the next thing I knew, people started sharing their lived experience. And I realized that throughout my life, whether I was a low wage childcare worker or the mom of a kid with a disability, um, I made the big issues that I face in my life um, the focus of my energy and advocacy but for some reason, my struggle with paying the rent was something that I kept very private. I was embarrassed. I felt like a failure for not being able to keep up with annual rent increases that were anywhere from 10% to one year I had a rent increase that was around 30%. Um, and in that group, I found community of people that were, uh, many of whom were facing similar challenges uh, who were much worse off than I was, which was hard to imagine as a low-income single mom and a small business owner and the parent of a kid, a medically involved, medically fragile kid. Uh, and I was also a lot able to connect with a lot of advocates, whether they were involved with community-based organizations or they were academics or even landlords and realtors uh, who were very concerned about the crisis they were seeing unfold in our community. So what started as a joke became a kind of clearinghouse for information and resources and a springboard for organizing and activism. 
And that was the place where people started encouraging me to run for city council. I was dismissive of that uh, idea in the beginning. I had abandoned any hope of a life in politics, I think when I was uh, vice president of my student body in ninth grade <laughs> and um, was really happy doing what I was doing, selling books and uh, curating art shows and, and publishing, uh, putting out publications. But I was, like I said, really struggling. And finally enough people encouraged me to run that I thought, well, uh, this wasn't my dream, but it's starting to feel like a calling and people must see something in me that I don't recognize in myself, but would lend itself well to this position. So I ran, um, housing justice was not the only plank on my platform, but it was virtually the only thing that anyone wanted to talk about in 2016, the year I was running. I won on that issue, I believe, because our city council was just not acting with the urgency required when half of the renters in Portland uh, were cost burdened and half of them spending over 50% of their income on housing costs, having to make decisions, having to make choices between paying the rent and keeping the lights on, paying the rent and feeding their family, paying the rent and um, getting the medical care or medication that they needed. Uh, I call election night of 2016 the best and worst night of my life because moments before I found out that I had won, the election was called for Donald Trump, which was certainly a shock uh, to me and not the political environment that I imagined <laughs> walking into uh, when I took my seat on city council. So it's been, um, a different experience than I anticipated. And uh, I've really uh, done everything I can to uh, stabilize renters, which has been a major focus of my first four years in office, despite never having the Housing Bureau. Uh, I think it was Commissioner Saltzman that passed an ordinance many years ago saying that commissioners could bring items pertaining to any bureau they wanted, um, regardless of whether it was in their portfolio. And I very much appreciate that. Um, we passed the relocation ordinance in the first, my first 30 days in office, which helped stabilize tens of thousands of renters around the city. Um, and more recently we passed the fair access in renting package, which I found out today is going to be used as a national model for reducing barriers to housing, uh, especially housing discrimination. So I'm really proud of that work. Uh, FAIR took a lot longer than RELO, um, and I'm excited to get to continue to, to build, on, build on that work. And I'll just wrap up by saying, um, because I know the questions are limited. I'll just talk about a few things that I'm also really invested in. Uh, I'm the commissioner in charge of transportation, an assignment that I uh, did not relish in the beginning, but now absolutely love. And it's, uh, we've been able to bring our priorities of uh, equity and racial justice to, to that bureau, uh, as well as combating climate change and uh, improving safety, especially in East Portland, which has uh, suffered from decades of underinvestment. Um, climate change and environment are another big issue, working with our immigrant and refugee communities, especially in this current climate where they are being um, persecuted by our federal government. Um, Oh, and I also am your arts liaison, as well as the liaison to Venture Portland, which is uh, the entity that uh, organizes or works with all of our business districts. So it's just a pleasure to get to serve the city uh, in those capacities, especially the um, ones that connect with where I'm coming from and, and what I'm about. And um, I'm just looking forward to getting to continue to build on that good work. And there goes a giant truck. <laughs> Forgive the background noise, everybody. It's all right. Yeah. Uh, we all have to work with the environments we have right now. Ooh, and now I hear a boombox. <laughs> 
All right. Well, um, BDNA asked neighbors to submit questions and then we combined the results into six questions for this interview. Uh, we also kind of looked back at some past questions that had been submitted for um, events we've held in the past for candidates. So um, you received those questions prior to this interview and I'm gonna ask them one at a time and then you can go ahead and answer. Sure. The first question is, in view of the Clackamas County wildfire crisis, what can the city government do to improve its procedures for disseminating emergency information to residents? Additionally, what should the city government do to better prepare residents and structures for the anticipated Cascadia subduction event? Okay, fires, earthquakes. I, I, part of me doesn't even wanna talk about earthquakes because I don't wanna conjure that up. Um, Earthquakes are alien, aliens is what I'm predicting will be the, the next uh, catastrophe. Anyhow, um, I didn't hire a DJ for this event. There is quite loud music going on outside. Um, it's not very obvious on this end. <laughs> okay, good. Um, what I witnessed uh, on social media and heard back from the public is although there were central ways for people for uh, central places where that information was being provided, people didn't know where to go to find it. And it, uh, I mean, I have a few thoughts of that about that. Number one, we have an emergency system where we can send text messages to residents. Why can't we utilize um, that system when we're facing like extremely hazardous air quality conditions where people need to know uh, what's safe and what's not safe. Um, more kind of consistent central updates. You could find information on the Multnomah County website if again if you knew where to where to look. Um, I made a list of about 15 priorities uh, once it became clear that we were going to have to shut down and that this uh, virus was uh, you know, turning into a pandemic. And among the many things, including flattening the curve and keeping people housed and delivering relief to people who were hardest hit, was um, creating ways to continue to communicate with the public and conduct civic engagement and closing the digital divide. Uh, because we know that, you know, we're all, I think most of us are struggling with a certain level of isolation, but for elders, people with disabilities, um, low income households, people that speak English as a second language, there's many communities who were already isolated and this is just exacerbating their circumstances. And if they don't have internet connection and they don't have internet ready, devices. Um, it's, I mean, I, I would consider not being connected to be a kind of public health crisis in this moment, because how do we find those people and get vital information to them. So I am crossing my fingers. I got, I got a few pieces of good news today. And one of them is that a um, contract with an online civic engagement uh, platform company that I've been working on pretty much since the shutdown is almost complete and we'll be launching it in October. And that platform will be a place where the city can push information out to the public, uh, can present policies and programs and projects for public feedback, which I'm really looking forward because definitely with PBOT, it's been a challenge. We can't do the open houses that we typically do. We can't, we're really constrained uh, with public engagement and that's vitally important for our transportation bureau. We can also let the public offer their own initiatives and connect with people around the city who are share their burning issues. Um, that's something I'm really excited about because uh, I have the, pleasure of taking the traffic and transportation class at PSU when I received that uh, PBOT assignment. Congressman Blumenauer helped establish that many years ago when he was on city council. And it's just a great introduction to the whole history of transportation planning in Portland and the challenges that we face around traffic and transportation. And um, 
I realized in that class, it, it, it was incredible to sit in a room probably of 30 community members, smart, engaged, well-informed, creative, resourceful community members, um, some, of who had, some of whom had overlap in their interests, but, but they were really there for a wide range of reasons. We all did class projects at the end to kind of share you know, what, what the issue was in our neighborhood or community that we were hoping to address. And it was just such an incredible opportunity for those people to come together and connect with each other. And it was a huge help to me stepping into that role. And I'm really excited to be able to provide a space for the whole city to have that same experience where they can, um, like I said, meet people who share their burning issues and start collaborating um, both within neighborhoods, but across the whole city. We'll also be able to use that platform for um, participatory budgeting and cultural and asset mapping. I'm really excited about it and hoping to roll that out in October. Uh, and then we're also uh, chipping away at that digital divide. It's uh, pretty significant. We estimate about 15% of our uh, residents are not connected and, and most of those individuals are gonna be low income households and, and potentially face other kind of barriers and challenges. So we are just about to distribute some technology uh, kits coming out of uh, the Office of Community Technology, which I am now the commissioner in charge of as well. Um, and I'm excited about that. It's, uh, it's not gonna solve the full need, but you know, any, anything we can do to move the city in the right direction, I think uh, is worthwhile right now. As far as the earthquake goes, <sighs> um, you know, I inherited a very contentious, uh, kind of conversation when I became the commissioner in charge of BDS around unreinforced masonry. We unfortunately, after months, and I think probably years leading up to me joining city council, really got nowhere with that conversation. It's something that we have to address. There's probably 1200 buildings in the city that are unreinforced masonry. masonry. Some of them are owned by the city, many of our schools, I think there are hospitals, certainly apartment buildings and commercial buildings that are very likely to collapse, um, injure and kill people and become an impediment to our emergency responders as they will fill our streets with rubble. So that is an issue that we have to revisit. Uh, and uh, I took several hours of NETS training when I first joined uh, city council and then quickly realized I really couldn't be a NETS volunteer and do my job and be a mom. So I didn't complete that training, but I'm so inspired by uh, our NETS volunteers and see incredible potential there for collaboration with our neighborhood associations and neighborhood coalitions to help our community get better prepared in case of a disaster like an earthquake. Because we know um, if it is the big one, uh, it could be days, even a couple weeks before we're able to um, get to people to start uh, recovering and, and restoring. And we're really going to be relying on our neighbors in the meantime. Uh, so Civic Life has had preliminary conversations with uh, the Fire Bureau and the Portland Bureau of Emergency Management about coordinating a city citywide uh, kind of preparedness and resiliency program um, that is very nascent. I, uh, <laughs> our resources are so are stretched so thin and just trying to deal with this current crisis that I don't anticipate being able to move forward uh, with that until we can at least see the bottom of this crisis. But it's something that I'm uh, really dedicated to. And um, I think it's a critical piece of our preparedness, preparedness and resiliency. 
I think I'll leave it at that. I'm sure there's uh, many other things I could mention, but um, though, uh, you know, I do have some notes here, but I really want to speak mostly off the off the cuff and speak to the things that I know know the most about. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Question two. To lessen tensions between police and residents and to leave the Police Bureau of Responsibilities not directly related to keeping the peace, how should the city government reshape or recast the Portland Police Bureau? Well, that's a really big question and one that we're actively engaged in right now. Um, I have been highly critical of the Police Bureau, not just since I took office, but um, from my earliest days of activism due to my own um, kind of experiences and eyewitness uh, accounts. Um, but I always like to start off by saying that we have left too many of our kind of systemic failures and social ills up to police to deal with. And that's unacceptable and obviously it's not working. Half of our phone calls to 911 are generated by issues around people experiencing homelessness, mental illness, and or addiction crises. These are not necessarily crimes. They are livability issues uh, for lack of a better term. And we know that the police are not the appropriate resource to send, but they're often the only um, alternative. So this conversation really has to be about what do we want the police to do for us and where do we need to invest money in the community or in new systems and structures within a government to address these challenges. I, um, you know, my experiences and interactions with law enforcement stem from um, being an activist, being a small business owner who's had my business broken into many times, um, and also the survivor of, of violent crime. And I've had the experience from arrest, uh, conviction, imprisonment and parole. Um, and I know as a crime survivor that we are failing our entire community, failing victims, and failing individuals who are coming out of the justice system uh, by not addressing the many barriers they face to success in community, whether that is getting a job, finding housing, um, qualifying for social services, having a felony conviction precludes you from student loans and um, I believe food stamps. And of course, there's a lot of stigma attached to it. And uh, it's just not working. So my hope or my intent is that we really bring more of a trauma-informed harm reduction model of uh, dealing with a lot of issues that we currently address with a you know kind of fear-based punitive system. So um, I'm very hopeful about the work of Portland Street Response that uh, we will see people experiencing mental illness who are on our streets receive the humane, compassionate care that they need and get connected with social services rather than be arrested, fined, uh, sometimes beaten and sometimes killed by the police. Um, trying to think of a few more concrete and examples. I'm really excited to get to work with our new DA, Mike Schmidt, who's one of my endorsers. I think, uh, I don't know if Portland yet realizes uh, what a big deal his election was and what a sea change he's going to bring 
to that office, but I know that he shares a lot of my same kind of concerns and priorities. Um, following the budget vote, uh, where I supported all of those amendments, I supported cutting the specialty units, I supported cutting the budget, but ultimately um, felt that we had not responded to community strongly enough. Um, I immediately started engaging with a group that's now become something called Reimagine Oregon. And it is a black led initiative with black community leaders and advocates working with electeds across our region all the way up uh, to the governor on the process of defunding the police and investing in community. And I'll just say when, when people talk about defunding, um, they're, they're typically talking about reducing budgets, not eliminating police, although some people are talking about that. They're called abolitionists. Um, but these conversations are really focused on addressing the disparate impacts to the Black community and uh, addressing past harms and investing in, in investing in community moving forward. And so uh, the mayor and I have been representing the city in those conversations. We've each taken on uh, different pieces of legislation that they want us to advance. Um, and I'll just end by saying, well, I need to talk about the protests. Uh, you know, this week, the three offices, officers who uh, were involved in the murder of Breonna Taylor, two of them were indicted and one of them apparently was indicted for shooting a, a wall and endangering a neighbor, um, which is uh, incredibly disappointing and painful verdict and um, so unhelpful in this moment of national uprising and reckoning with police violence and racial injustice um, and definitely highlights the work that we still need to do. I credit the protesters with how far city council was willing to go in June with those budget cuts and um, while I'm very concerned with uh, some of the violence we've seen on the street it's still true that the vast majority of protesters are peaceful. They are exercising their constitutional rights. Uh, and I don't believe that they are going to let up pressure until they see that their elected leaders at every level of government, city, county, state, and federal uh, are doggedly pursuing uh, not just reform, but a complete transformation of our public safety and policing systems. Um, I'm invested in that work. I'm excited about that work. And uh, I'm currently working with Commissioner Hardesty on a munitions restriction ordinance, uh, which is very complicated. That's another thing I'll say. People want change overnight. And what all of us are learning is how much of our power locally has been bargained away through um, contract bargaining over the decades and how much power to change policing lies entirely outside of our jurisdiction and really with the state legislature and is codified in our state constitution. So some things we can do very quickly, some things will take um, a legislative session or two and some things we'll have to bring to the voters. Uh, it's going to be a lengthy iterative process uh, but I plan on showing people every day that we it is a priority and that we are determined to make progress on it. All right thank you. Let's go to question three. What actions can the city government take to help resolve the homelessness crisis? Oh boy, you guys really picked the easy ones, huh? You know, we like to really challenge our candidates. 
So we can't really, the city of Portland cannot solve this crisis on its own. Uh, we need our state and federal partners to step up as well. This crisis has been decades in the making. I hear people talking about, um, you know, the old days of Portland, like it was Pleasantville. And I remember Portland in the 70s and 80s. It was a rough town. I worked at Third and Burnside at a vintage clothing store in 1986. I had to bribe um, guys that were sleeping in the doorway with sodas to get out of the way so I could open the shop. Um, this is, I would say, our visible homeless crisis is obviously much worse um, in the last, has become worse in the last several years. But this crisis, uh, whether it's homelessness or the rent crisis or the, you know, just lack of affordable housing has been decades in the making. And it's been by design. I mean, we have chosen not to protect renters and we have chosen not to build affordable housing and not to even preserve affordable housing uh, that existed uh, a decade or so ago. We've chosen to underinvest in mental health and addiction services. Um, we've collectively made decisions, whether it's voting for measures or candidates um, that have led us to this place that we're at today and we're going to have to work together to get out of it. But the need is so great uh, that the city really can't solve it on its own. What I can tell you we are looking at now, uh, and these are, these are things I've really been pushing for since I got to city council and now with this ongoing crisis that we're in um, and the threat to public health and safety, I think we're finally going to see more effort. Um, we, if we can't house or shelter people indoors, we have to offer them safe sites to sleep outside. And you saw the city open, I think three uh, sanctioned campsites. Uh, we need more of those until we don't have people sleeping on the streets. That is not an ideal solution and some people are really offended by the suggestion that we should continue to let people sleep outdoors. But again, if we have nowhere to, to put them, it's the next best solution is that they have a safe place to sleep, they have hygiene facilities, they have a place where they can leave their things during the day um, and they have a place that they're not going to be forcefully displaced from. I have asked the mayor to convene a conversation between the city, the county, and the school districts to really assess all of the resources and assets we have right now. We have so many facilities that are, that are empty and unused, community centers, schools. Those places have showers and bathrooms and laundry facilities and kitchens. And at the very least, they could be used as day centers, places for people to come um, clean up, wash their clothes, find some food, uh, connect with resources. Um, I think, you know, we really didn't anticipate this one, you know, it's been one crisis after another, and we've been in this reaction mode. And now that we're six months in, and we know that it's probably going to be six months more or longer of some kind of shutdown that uh, we have to take a breath and just assess what what we have to work with and and utilize it uh, much more resourcefully. I, I, I do think we could be doing a lot more for uh, people who are experiencing homelessness and people who are struggling the most in this moment if we, if we were really kind of marshalling all those underutilized or totally unused resources. 
Um, again, I'm very hopeful about Portland Street response and just offering an alternative to people experiencing mental illness who are on the streets. Um, an alternative to uh, interactions with the police, which are, is traumatizing. If they're arrested, it just creates another barrier to getting housed or finding work or, or recovery. Um, but, you know, and we, the county obviously plays a role in this as, as well. We invest most of our dollars for homelessness services in the joint office, which the county oversees. Um, hopeful about that Metro uh, measure that passed that's gonna help us build hundreds of permanently affordable uh, units with uh, supportive services because uh, it's not always as simple as getting someone housed if they're experiencing mental health uh, challenges they're likely to need additional supports in order to be successful and stay housed <sighs> I'm sure I'm forgetting uh, some critical thing, but I will say that uh, as controversial as my tenant protections have been among some segments of the community, uh, I'm really proud of that work. It laid the groundwork for the state, uh, strengthening their tenant protections. We've uh, communicated with cities around the country who have wanted to take a look at our policy work and uh, who are interested in adopting similar policies. It is obvious now that stemming the tide of cost burdening and cost burdening and displacement is a critical piece of our overall affordable housing strategy as well as stemming the tide of people slipping into homelessness we know that housing unaffordability is the number one cause of homelessness. Um, so proud of that work. I um, hope to only build on it in the next four years and uh, we're turning our attention to anti-displacement strategies, something that the city's been talking about for a long time, but so far RELO is really the most significant uh, kind of anti-displacement protection we have in place. And uh, we're work on, working on developing a tenant opportunity to purchase uh, policy, which would give renters first right of refusal if their homes go on the market. Uh, and uh, we would be working with community partners to help low-income renters become homeowners and just get out of the rental racket and move into home ownership and building wealth, which uh, we know is just so critical to community stability and getting to, getting to put down roots and choose where, where you live um, is, is critical in so many ways uh, for your children's education, for work, for your own schooling, and just for your sense of community. It's, it's really tough to feel like you're at the whim of a landlord or a rental market that prioritizes profit over, over, or, over every other concern. And it, it really hasn't worked out very well for us, so. Okay. Thank you. Let's move to uh, question four. What should the city government do to address the fact that in 2020, nearly 25% of the actions listed in the Multnomah County City of Portland at Climate Action Plan from 2015 are facing serious impediments to implementation? <sighs> Well, I mean, first I want to highlight one very critical thing that has happened and that's the passage of the Portland Clean Energy Fund. 
the first uh, black led environmental initiative to be uh, organized and passed uh, in Oregon and uh, with the leadership of Commissioner Hardesty and now um, I wonder what we, what rep, uh, representative elect <laughs> con, uh, con fam, is that what we would call someone who hasn't taken their seat yet? I think so. Um, that sounds right. I think it's something elect at least. Yeah, and so, you know, we just put out our first RFP for PSAF. It's very exciting. The budget is only eight or $9 million. <laughs> Uh, the next year of PSEF, it will be in the tens of millions of dollars. And that is going to mean um, just huge economic opportunity for communities of color and women in the green economy um, and incredible advances in, in sustainability in our community, whether it's solar energy, energy efficient housing retrofits, apprenticeships, and uh, union track family wage jobs. I'm so excited about that. And I really do think uh, it, it is going to be transformative for our community. Uh, I was the only sitting commissioner in 2018 to endorse the PSEF. It was, again, very controversial, but not controversial with the voters. I think it got 65, 70% of the vote. Um, I also helped author and pass what was at the time the most uh, kind of ambitious renewables resolution for the city of Portland. And now uh, as the transportation commissioner, I am really um, kind of endlessly pursuing uh, policies and, and programs that will move the dial on transportation-based carbon emissions. It's the biggest single contributor. It's 40% of our carbon emissions comes from trans transportation. Um, we absolutely do need to speed up this process. Uh, you know, one of the thing, one of my many lessons in office has been realizing how big the chasm is between people's concern and people's willingness to act and figuring out how to bridge that I think is essential. Um, I'm not someone that thinks that we should leave our environment and our climate up to individual consumer choice. I think that, um, putting the onus on, of the burden on consumers, actually, uh, it, if, the if there's a choice to be made, it's too late. We really have to start working um, as, as leaders and policymakers to force industry to uh, raise their standards so that some of those choice currently, you know, choices uh, are just the norm. Um, hopeful about the let, let's get moving uh, measure. I, it's the Metro transportation measure. I spent the last 18 months of my life working on that and really uh, pushing hard for uh, climate equity and safety improvements in all those corridors. I'm really proud of that package. It's doesn't, it's not it doesn't, it's not going to solve our problem, but it's going to deliver some really critical improvements to our uh, regional transportation infrastructure, especially making, uh, making these corridors safer for pedestrians, bicyclists, and transit, and helping people um, get to where they need to go more reliably and efficiently is another uh, priority of mine. And that's, that's what the Rose Lane bus project was um, focused on. Well, I'm a little concerned about people's transit habits as we 
emerge from this shutdown. We'll see um, if people feel comfortable getting back back on the bus. I hope they will. I think uh, other countries uh, are seeing a return to mass transit and um, safe practices. Um, yeah, there, I mean, there's just a laundry list of things that we need to do and we need to do them about a hundred times faster than we are doing them. Um, I really have made climate change uh, top priority uh, in the work that I'm doing and I'm endorsed by Sunrise Movement PDX as well as the Oregon League of Conservation Voters um, for that work. And I'm really looking forward to, to advancing it. Uh, as soon as we get out of this, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we can do both, right? We can deal with multiple crises and we can make um, headway on our climate goals. I'd say, you know, in, in this moment, even the most pessimistic among us, I think really has to look on the bright side and look for silver linings and the realization of how many of us can work from home and that we actually don't have to go back to commuting to work five days a week. Um, and uh, we could greatly reduce carbon emissions just by changing our work habits. I've really enjoyed uh, the Safe Streets and Healthy Businesses initiative that we've rolled out through PBOT, just prioritizing our greenways for cyclists and pedestrians to give Portlanders more space to enjoy being outdoors while maintaining safe social distancing and um, sharing the right of way in creative ways as we see, you know, there's less demand for cars uh, we've been able to open up some of the right of way to businesses for pickup drop off uh, dining tables and even closing streets for public plazas. Um, and I think So I think a lot of great conversations have begun as a result of this crisis that are going to help us move forward, in particular in the transportation sector. Thank you. All right, let's move to question five. Okay, question five. When developing programs or designing projects, what can the city government do to bolster resident participation and improve communication with affected residents? Well, I spoke about this a little bit earlier. I'm very hopeful that a kind of critical mass of Portlanders are gonna get excited about their online platform and sign up and start engaging. We're, it is a pilot, one year pilot program and we're gonna be using the platform for PBOT projects uh, in particular. That's a lot of P's. Um, so that's one way, uh, certainly, hosting more forums and figuring out other COVID safe opportunities uh, to gather in real life, hopefully we'll, <laughs> we'll begin. And, um, you know, better utilizing our neighborhood network and our business associations. I think one of the many surprises and frustrations that I've had moving into this position is how outdated our technology is and how um, poorly we're doing at customer service and that we're really not utilizing our resources as well as we could be. So, um, for instance, we don't have a 311 system. Instead, we have dozens, possibly hundreds of different phone lines that uh, residents will be lucky to even find and then even luckier to have someone pick up. It's more likely that they'll get a voicemail and uh, they may or may not get a return phone call. It's, it's just been this process, I think, of accretion over the years. <laughs> you know, it's, kind of nobody's 
fault. It's just grown into this very unwieldy system. And so I have, uh, I, I really spearheaded this new effort to establish a 311 system. It's in the very early stages. I'm hopeful um, about that. Um, you know, when I had BDS, I discovered that we had a policy of sending notices for developments um, to property owners who live within 150 feet or own property within 150 feet of the development. And I said, well, that's not public engagement. That is property owner engagement. Don't you think that everyone that lives uh, within close proximity to that development has a right to be informed and to engage in whatever public process is available to them to be heard, whether they're renters or they're business owners who are renting in that neighborhood. And so I was able to change that policy at BDS and I've strongly encouraged other uh, commissioners and, and bureau directors to, to do the same. Um, there's no, you know, people who rent are just as invested as in this community as, as anyone else. And there's no reason or no excuse to treat them like second class citizens who don't deserve the same kind of basic uh, courtesy that we extend to property owners. So I think I've covered everything that I had to say about number five. Uh, I mean, I'll just end by saying that there are a lot of barriers to participation in our current system and I've been really committed to trying to expand our existing civic engagement network and also ensure that we're offering um, adequate accommodations to people with disabilities or people who experience language barriers. Um, and uh, we've made some headway there, but if we, if we truly want to engage our whole community and receive feedback that's representative of our whole community, we have to do we have to do a lot better. Excellent, thank you. All right, uh, looks like we have one more question. Question number six. With an eye to advancing Portland's mission, goals, and values, what can the city government do to attain greater collaboration between itself and its 94 recognized neighborhood associations? Hmm, well, I've been revisiting the, you know, long storied history of our neighborhood association network and discovered in the earlier days that we had over 15% participation in, uh, in our neighborhood associations, which is extraordinary to me because we know today it's probably not even 1% of Portland residents are actively engaged with their neighborhood associations. And I think that is a shame. Um, we put a lot of money into the system. I don't feel that enough of it is reaching the neighborhood associations and, um, and community members. I love the small grants program. It's one of the things that is most impressive to me about what we do um, under the umbrella of uh, the neighborhood system and just the incredible ways that community members are able to leverage the small dollar grants and do just astounding things in their community. So I would like to see uh, more resources reaching communities. Um, greater involvement and I mean, it's no secret that I would also like to see the city recognize uh, the different ways that people choose to organize and identify and bring them into the fold of the neighborhood system. Um, I think in a city that has grown as much as Portland, that has diversified as much as Portland, and that has seen 
tens of thousands of um, BIPOC community members and low-income households displaced from their communities of choice that we really have to give people multiple ways to engage. Um, there's no reason in this day and age when we have the internet and uh, we have all these tools at our disposal that we have to continue with a system that requires you to show up at one, you know, date, place, time per month to have a voice in your neighborhood network. So I'm really hoping that uh, we can continue that community conversation about how we can uh, expand the system and what that would look like. Unfortunately, we didn't get to that point with uh, in that conversation of, you know, well, what would this look like? Would there be councils representing specific um, cultural groups or, uh, or social issues that would be structured just like a neighborhood association or would it look like something else? So there's lots of conversations to continue. Um, I'm a big fan of <laughs> democratically run organizations. It's why I started a district-wide PTA rather than start my own kind of personality just driven nonprofit. I really like the accountability of that democratic structure where you elect a board and you're required to engage and inform your members and you vote on, on issues. But when you don't have a diversity of members in that room to cast that vote, you, you can't be capturing all the kind of unique needs and challenges in your community. I think that's, that's, that's my primary concern. Neighborhood associations do great work for their neighborhoods and it's absolutely a valid legitimate way to organize that I hope never goes away. Um, but there are so many people in our community whose needs are not being served and their voices are not being heard. And for the purposes of public engagement and input, I do think the city has an obligation to do a better job reaching out to more people in a more, in a more diverse uh, group of people. So. Although that conversation was very contentious, I definitely was not prepared for how threatening some people found the idea of expanding the system or the ways that uh, my intentions were misunderstood. It's still an exciting, fascinating topic for me and it's one that I really hope that we get to return to um, we put code change entirely on hold during the shutdown just because of how hard engagement was. And uh, because of all the kind of raw feelings in the community about code change, I didn't want anyone to feel like we were pushing something through um, when people couldn't effectively engage. Um, so hopefully that comes back around next year in uh, whatever form it takes. Uh, and in the meantime, we're gonna have some participatory budgeting uh, to do, which um, I'm excited about. That's a form of civic engagement and participatory democracy, getting decide to decide where we put our public dollars. Um, and that platform I mentioned will be Will be used for that. I think we have three different initiatives and about three and a half million dollars to invest in community-based um, projects and the community is going to decide how to spend it and I think that's really cool. Great, thank you. Yeah. All right, that is the last of our um, official questions. I want to thank you, Chloe, for answering these questions and um, give you an opportunity to make a final statement before we end the recording. Okay, um, well, 
first of all, thanks for having me. This was fun. And um, I like this format. I like the opportunity to give a little longer answers and actually think about what I what I want to say. And I'll just close by saying that, you know, this isn't this isn't what I imagined doing with my life. It really was a calling. And I ran for this position to do good work for my community and my city that I love, even though I felt like Portland was trying to kill my dreams and force me <laughs> out of the city at a certain point in my life. Um, and I really ran to represent people who are underrepresented, unrepresented, and underserved. That is not to the exclusion of everyone else. Um, I think that there's a strong benefit of having someone like me with that commitment on council. Uh, I will always put people and our planet before profit. I have taken a pledge not to take fossil fuel donations, to never take money from the police union. I am not beholden to any lobby or special interest group. I am really just beholden to the people of the city and I'm committed to uh, doing, doing right by them. And I think that I have a track record to prove that. And uh, you can visit my website at votechloe.com to learn more about my accomplishments of the last few years, my priorities moving forward and my long list of endorsers, which um, campaigning isn't very fun, I'm gonna admit that. Uh, but one of the fun things is getting to reflect on the last few years and realizing how many amazing kind of partnerships and relationships uh, that you've built and seeing those people uh, come together to to support you. That's That's been, uh, a really positive uh, experience for me. All of those endorsements are based on real relationships and real work that I've done uh, with my colleagues or, or with community members. And I would love to keep doing that. So I would be honored to have your vote this November. Thanks again for this opportunity. Uh, nice to see you and uh, take care everybody. Thank you so much. For more information and other candidate interviews, please visit brentwood-darlington.org.